All right, so welcome back everyone. We will proceed with our third working group, the topic, the focus of which is GeoAI, that is artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and geospatial technology. And we'll define what that actually means. But similar to previous session, there's been so many developments in this particular area for the for recent years. And we'll take a look at what are some of the opportunities that are available, as well as some of the challenges that come along the way. So in a similar session or similar spirit to some of the previous sessions we had, we have a team of experts here from the academic community, as well as some Esri folks. And Mansoor Rad is going to moderate this session for us. So Mansoor is a chief technologist at Esri, specializing in this particular field. He's also a fellow colleague at Johns Hopkins University. He's been teaching big data analytics there for, I don't know, many, many years now. And um, as well as started teaching a GOAI class a couple of years ago. So Mansoor is going to moderate this session for us. Thank you, Jerry. Welcome everybody to this. Uh, I think it's gonna be very exciting for the uh, session. Uh, first, I'd like to, uh, like everybody on the panel here, to present themselves. Uh, Dr. Madden, please. Hi, my name is Marguerite Madden. I'm a professor in the Department of Geography and also the director of the Center for Geospatial Research. Um, I was a past president of ASPRS and also technical commission president of ISPRS. And I teach um, classes in the Department of Geography on aerial imagery um, and some graduate seminars, and we're venturing into uh, machine learning and deep learning. Awesome. One day I have to come and see you. I mean, I live here, I live here in Georgia too. So, and uh, actually, my son just got accepted at uh, UGA. So, go Bulldogs! Ah, <laughs> uh, great. <laughs> uh, Omar, are you uh, please? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Omar. I lead the AI cross-sector team, and um, I've been working with many customers on combining AI, machine learning, deep learning with uh, imagery analytics and GIS. So happy to be with you today. Awesome. Uh, Greg? Yes, my name is Greg Bruner. I work for Esri's professional services team, where I help customers implement uh, machine learning and GeoAI techniques. I also adjunct teach at St. Louis University, where I teach programming for GIS. And just this past semester, I've started figuring out how to integrate some of the machine learning and GeoAI into my coursework. And uh, David, please. Hi, everyone. David Yu, I'm a data scientist on the GeoAI team here at Esri. That's the same team as Omar. And I focus mainly on deep learning and computer vision. And I'll be able to answer some of your questions today. So please, if you have any questions, type them into the Q&A chat box. Right. Uh, so let's get started. Actually, something very important that everybody's going to confuse a little bit about is the difference between AI and ML and deep learning. And how does that fuse with the GeoAI and stuff like that? And with that, I'm going to let Omar take it and uh, give us a nice, uh, good deep dive uh, description about that. Go ahead, Omar, please. Awesome. Thanks, Mansoor. So yeah, I just wanted to provide a, a quick overview of what do we mean by GeoAI, which I'm sure you guys have heard the term before. So we look at it as the intersection of these two very interesting worlds. I mean, you guys obviously know GIS and geography. Now, the way we look at AI is the big pursuit of achieving human level intelligence by machines. Obviously, it's a big pursuit started in the 1950s. And definitely, we have not reached uh, that uh, yet uh, on a general level, maybe on a more narrow level. Machine learning as a subfield of AI that's about learning from data to derive rules and extract patterns instead of being explicitly programmed. And deep learning, which we're going to focus on a lot of time today, uh, as a subfield of machine learning using deep neural networks. And it's becoming generally good at uh, dealing with high dimensional data, unstructured data like images, voice, and text. So uh, with the intersection of these two worlds together, we start seeing what we call GeoAI, which is the field of applying data mining, machine learning, data science, deep learning, all of these topics together with geospatial analytics to solve different kinds of problems. And there are three uh, main patterns of problems that we see. But before that, one of the interesting things that we, we see is this kind of overlap, this kind of uh, fusion of GeoAI helps GIS professionals step into the power of machine learning to use in their analyses. And the same thing uh, on the other side, AI experts, machine learning, data scientists tap into the power of spatial analytics for their workflows, which we can see in three main areas. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of areas, but uh, three major patterns 
object detection and feature extraction from different kinds of imagery, as we're going to see today, uh, predicting geospatial events, uh, ones that are highly impacted by spatial factors, and finally finding uh, patterns and clusters of interest that are statistically significant from uh, geospatial data. And these are some examples from uh, the first branch of uh, GeoAI, which is predictive spatial analytics. You can see problems like predicting road crashes uh, affected by and the road uh, structure or maybe in crimes and water main failures, optimizing patrol allocation, yield forecast for agriculture and so on. Obviously the world of imagery is a big one here. I would say it's the biggest one so far in terms of like derived impact, in terms of like automation, uh, bringing automation to the process of analyzing imagery, detecting features like damaged structures and houses, uh, map production automation, like uh, building footprint detection, land cover, mapping with high resolution, crop field assessment, health assessment, like palm trees, as you can see here, and the list goes on. A lot of examples, anything that you can detect under one or two seconds, we can generally train AI to do it if we have good training data. And finally, pattern finding, uh, which is about finding statistically significant clusters in vector data. So with that said, I'm going to pass it back to Mansoor so we can have a discussion about that very topic, GeoAI. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you, Omar. That was a great, good cap of uh, the difference between AI, ML, and, uh, and deep learning. And I think that was very important. Uh, people kind of mix them up, these terms in here. And I think it's good that you created a beautiful separation. And of course, how does that apply to GIS is awesome. So with that in mind, like we usually like the other sessions, we're going to start up with a poll to actually go through these ideas here. And uh, let's see what the audience look like. Uh, so the first question is, are you currently teaching? Um, GeoAI class, machine learning, or deep learning. And now, of course, you know the difference between, so it'll be interesting to see that. Second one is, are you implementing GeoAI concept in your teaching today with your, and more importantly, what level of students you are being engaged with? And third question is the application of GeoAI. Are you using it for uh, feature extraction, prediction, classification, uh, prescriptive analytics, and anything else. And of course, very, very important uh, scenario, like what Omar talked about here. We're seeing a lot of imagery, but um, a lot of people are using other forms. So we'd like to hear from you guys what is uh, going on in here. Um, so I'll give you a minute here to answer this. Uh, for me personally, um, like uh, Jerry was saying, um, I wish I could, I've been teaching this for quite some time. Um, I love to redo some of the classes because the technology is changing so much that I like to bring in some of the new things, like especially the deep learning into, the, um, into, into my class. I'm hoping to do that again. Um, and again, uh, for me, at uh, John Hopkins, uh, we teach more of the kind of like the graduate and the people that are uh, that are coming back to do their classes, which is kind of good. And uh, us in professional services here, the team, Omar, me, Greg, and David, we work with all these feature extraction, prediction. I mean, it's kind of interesting. I wish we should have said other, we should have put another, we should have put category here all, you know? And of course, like what Omar is saying, a lot, a lot of aerial imagery is happening for us, but uh, LIDAR, is making a big push um, uh, from various domains. And we saw uh, now how powerful RGIS is fuses with all of that scenario in here. Um, I think uh, I'll give maybe another 10 seconds here. So let's see the results here in a little bit. We're gonna, let's close the poll. Let's look at the results. Um, awesome. Wow, uh, I did not expect that, to be honest with you. Um, Dr. Madden, what do you think of that uh, first one here? A lot of them are saying no, which is a little bit, uh, um, I'm, I don't, I don't want to say disappointing, but I was hoping that this would have been much more advanced right now. What do you think about that? Oh, I guess I'm not surprised because I think there's a lot of interest, mm. but not a lot of knowledge of how to do it. I, see. Um, I think faculty, uh, our faculty are, you know, we're trying to train ourselves up in order to be able to teach it. Right. So any kind of resources for that, we will, we will really welcome them. 
Excellent. Well, as you know, uh, uh, we have massive resources. Omar, can you? We can post it. Or we can post the. We can post some on the chat. Some of the resources. We love you guys to take out take out these resources. Use them. Um, and again, not very difficult. Um, we can teach the teachers us, and then we can go from there. Um, let when COVID is finished, we'll come down. I'll come down to campus, and we'll do a Vulcan mind meld. How's that? No, that'd be good. <laughs> it will be fun, huh? of be course. Um, I'm very glad that undergraduate students are also as contributing to graduate student. For me, I think this is now showing that this has been kind of pushed down, and the advanced scenario is not. Uh, the advanced stories that people have been talking about that you need the graduate level to do it is now doing going down to undergrad, which is awesome. Um, Dr. Madden, what do you think about that one too? Oh, definitely. I, you know, that's what I meant by the interest in it. Um, you know, graduate students um, want to use it in their research. Um, undergraduates are following uh, all the papers they read. You know, are, are discussing deep learning and machine learning. Right. We have been using machine learning algorithms for classification in our remote sensing classes for a mm -hmm. while. So, you know, random forest or, or um, support vector models, but um, but I think it's just expanding into into all different um, areas of, of interest now. Right. Um, Omar, what do you think of the features where they're using it? That's an interesting also category, isn't it? Yes. Yep, absolutely. I think uh, thanks to the uh, power of convolution neural networks mm -hmm. and the fact that you don't really need to handcraft these features and it can automatically understand what are the features contributing to an object or something, it made it quite easier versus other machine learning techniques to extract features out of imagery, uh, which I think is one of the main reasons behind the excitement and the impact, to be honest, uh, uh, after it. And, right. I, and I'm, I'm very uh, uh, like excited about that because finally we have a powerful capability, deep learning, becoming much easier and accessible uh, and, and providing high impact. So I think it makes sense. Right, great. And uh, Greg, what do you think of the sources of the data that people are using here? Yeah, I, I mean, I see a lot of use of aerial imagery, Landsat, um, elevation models, uh, products derived from elevation models like slope and aspect and flow direction, those kind of things. Um, so it doesn't surprise me at all that this variety of imagery data sources are being used for deep learning and, and GUAI. Right, excellent, excellent. So um, one again, one of the exciting parts like what we saw previously for us when in RGIS, in, at the SRI, this so, the capabilities are now starting to become so um, ubiquitous, but also what people are keep on forgetting, which is something very important, is the downloaded models, right? Um, Omar, can you talk about our downloaded model more, please? Absolutely. So we've seen that uh, sometimes a lot of the challenge in the process that people face when doing these workflows is training the model and finding the good training data. That's why we thought about like, why don't we start like building these models, like training them and making them available for free on mm -hmm. Living Atlas. So if you go to the Living Atlas right now and search for DLPK, you're going to find a lot of these models for building footprints, land cover, road segments, you name it. And what, what I really like about this is that it's plug and play, right? You can download it, just run it in your notebook or ArcGIS Pro, and you always have the room to optimize using your local data if you find the model performance not that great. So I think not just uh, for Esri, to be honest, like generally for the whole market, the more we have these pre-trained models, uh, uh, the more we're going to see higher adoption rates because I think training and finding good data is like the main bottlenecks and this is uh, hopefully solving them. Great. Um, I, uh, I want to jump into something also that Dr. Madden has brought in, which is the challenges. Beside them, beside the teachers, not be, beside us not teaching the teachers right now, I think another challenge is uh, kind of hardware also related, but the cloud is kind of solving this. When you want to go into this domains of geo AI and stuff like that, there, we rely so heavily on uh, GPU to do a lot of that information and not everybody has access to this GPU. Thank God for the, um, like the Azure or the AWS or GCPs, they're making them accessible very easily. Um, but so Madden, in your school, or what is that? What is the accessibility for people to have these what I call higher level compute than the traditional, uh, than the traditional? Oh, I have a PC or stuff like that. Again, a lot of customers, not a lot of the students um, 
you know, they have their Mac or their 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 uh, Windows machine. They don't have like the high-end GPUs to do these number crunching. So, what is the challenges that schools like UGA are doing to help out students to bridge that gap? Well, we certainly start out with subsets, you know, and Tommy talked about that in his his um, segment. Um, so manageable data sets to begin with. But then when graduate students are using it in their research, they definitely bump up against the, the limitations. Um, so then, um, and I and I can also defer to my colleagues and Dr. Sergio Bernardez has done a lot of this. He'll he'll do parallel computing, rig up the multiple computers in our labs to, to be doing that. Um, we do have a high performance computer that, that students and faculty have access to, um, but then they would need to have their own code. Um, you know, they can't run ArcGIS or ArcGIS Pro or any um, on, on that. So then you, you're, you're bringing data out, running it, and bringing it back in. So that's a, that's a workaround right now, but, but right. that is, is working. Well, ArcGIS Pro right now, the latest one, by the way, you do not need to get out and come back in again. If you instantiate it like on a Azure or an AWS instance that has a GPU, the nice thing about it is if you have enough memory and you have enough disk, now you can process a lot of data in, in RGS Pro. And by the way, I don't know if you notice people, uh, you can use the tools, which is push button and get up and running very quickly. But from our experience, we finding that people want to drop down a little bit more to the Python notebook and stuff like that. Greg, can you talk a little bit about the notebook experience that uh, what you've been doing with your scenario and stuff like that? Please? Yeah, yeah. So I, I fundamentally think that um, if you're going to get involved in deep learning and GeoAI, you really need to commit to learning a little bit of Python. And really with imagery being foundational to GeoAI and machine learning, you're going to have to become familiar with uh, working with arrays in Python and, and those kind of things, which, which can be challenging, to be honest. Um, but um, in terms of accessing GPUs, uh, one of the things that I've adjusted in my course is that I use a lot of ArcGIS notebooks. And so at least if I want students to go through some of these uh, GPU-enabled models or, or GPU-enabled um, examples, they can use the ArcGIS notebooks with the GPU enabled capability and, and go through those. So, you know, that's actually a big change I've made in my course is trying to push um, push materials, uh, lectures and, and lessons and stuff into notebooks so that um, they have this powerful capability at their hands. Yeah, I agree with you actually. This is something that one of my requirements for my two classes that I'm doing is the GUI and the big data class is uh, they need to know Python programming. It's a fact, unfortunately, right now, when they're gonna start students, they wanna start doing these advanced analytics, they need to go down to scripting the original. I mean, you can still do it with the tools, but it's very, you know, the push button tools, I find them constructive on my side and I find some of the students, they find them when they drop down to notebook experience, which is the new thing, right? They love it. Yes, there's the classic way of uh, model builder, but we're finding from our experiences that people going to the notebook uh, are loving it more and stuff like that. By the way, to the person, to Dave, Mr. Johnson, that answer, is there documentation or the guidance on explaining the process of retraining the models on how to do that? Um, I would like to refer to the... Um, chat room please there's a lot of example omar can you talk a little bit about that uh, please the retraining process if you don't mind please and and uh, again uh, the samples here that we talked about is very important go ahead omar please absolutely um so i mean yeah, making models portable is uh, is is, uh, is is something interesting, right? It's uh, sometimes it's challenging. So how can you make a model work on different kind of sensors, different kind of resolutions, imagery, and stuff like that? So usually the kind of pattern that we see is that you have a good model that you try to make it as general as possible, make it generalizable. But then when you apply it in the real world, sometimes the accuracy isn't that great. So the thing here is that there are some techniques like transfer learning that would help optimize the model and make it uh, uh, achieve higher accuracy. If you transfer the learning right somehow so that you optimize with your local data. So we, uh, uh, you can do this easily if you use any pre-trained model today in RGS Pro, for example, and uh, choose to retrain using your own local data. And as Mansoor mentioned, it's a button click. You don't need to write any code. And you can do the same thing from the Python API. And I think that's going to be the case for some time. That's why we're seeing these terms like ML ops or machine learning ops, where you end up with different models 
that have been trained on different kind of data sets with different accuracies. And you need to keep track of this, right? Having some sort of model gallery and always have the ability to like combine some models together, get some models, apply transfer learning, retrain with your data. Uh, because you always are uh, going to have like changing requirements, changing imagery. So this concept of like uh, like retraining is, I think, is important, especially for production related scenarios. And Omar, I think part of that question was also asking, are there any uh, best practices, recommendations that you can give on perhaps your training over different resolutions of imagery? Sure, sure. I mean, uh, here's we get this question a lot, which is like, is that model good for this kind of resolution or not? Now, the thing is, there is no golden rule here, right? Uh, I always like to start with what I have. Uh, let's say I want to do a land cover mapping, and the model has been trained on one meter resolution imagery, but now I have a 30 centimeter resolution and I want to run it. I'm not going to start from scratch. I'm going to try this model first and validate it against some testing data and see what kind of accuracy do I have. Trying to make uh, the uh, validation on diversified data sets as possible. So choosing different areas, different geographies, and stuff like that and benchmarking against uh, the validation uh, data. Now, if the accuracy isn't that great, I start tracking which parts uh, or geographies have less accuracy, which classes. Sometimes we find that building footprints, for example, have less accuracy in some areas. So we go back and label more data from that area and retrain the model and reapply it. And I think Mansoor has a lot of experience doing that with our customers. Mansoor, yes. do you want to chime in on that? <laughs> um, uh, data labeling. As you know, we're not data scientists. I call ourselves <laughs> data janitors. Why? Because guess what? We spend a lot of our time data cleansing, right? So we've been promoted from scientists to janitorials, right? Why? But actually, it's a, it's a lot of hard work, as Omar is saying, right? To prepare that label data and we go to it. And something else that I want to mention here, again, from our experience, for example, though the pre-trained model are working very well, these were kind of a little bit like, for example, I'll give you the example of the uh, road detection. These work very, very well in the United States. But for example, when we took it to imply it in Kuwait, when actually at the developer summit, one of our customers, the public authority for civil information in Kuwait took that model. Well, in the beginning, it did not, did not work too well. And we tracked the metrics and like what Omar is saying. Well, we complemented, we took that model, right? And we complemented with additional local data and suddenly we shot off to up to the 93, 95% accuracy, which was awesome in here. Um, I'd like to go back to the ArcPy story here. Uh, yes, uh, Angela, you asked about, uh, is it the ArcPy module? It is the ArcPy module. You can still use the ArcPy module, the good old geoprocessing task that you're familiar with, right? And now with the learn model, right? The one that Greg talks about and stuff like that, you go into it. So now you're combining both scenarios in there and you're bringing additional model like scientific learn and stuff like that. Um, Dr. Madden, do you guys, what is your, is there like a class, like a uh, programming in Python in the beginning that UGA has that somebody is a requirement to for some of this or, can you tell us a little bit of the prerequisites, especially in programming, for, for them to go into that new level, please? We do have a, a programming and GIS class, mm -hmm. but we also um, am sitting in on a class taught right now on machine learning. And so that the introduction is learning Python, and all yeah. the exercises are implemented in Python. Um, the other thing we're doing is I, I'm pairing one of my graduate students with a, a graduate student in statistics, and he's co-advised by uh, myself and the statistics faculty member. So that's been a really nice partnership. And um, the statistics student um, will, will get the, the, the training samples from my student and then run some, run some processes and then bring them back to see where they're not, you know, where they're accurate, where they're not. So, so that's been a nice, um, a nice uh, uh, partnership, I think. Yes, um, people can a tendency, have a tendency of forgetting uh, the basics, right? Uh, the linear algebra, the statistics, and I think it's important to go back to them, which is, you know, they're very those fundamentals that they that we were taught in high school, right, uh, are very important. That's why I keep yelling to at my son, learn the fundamentals. He's like, I'll never use it again. Well, you know what? Look at look at you, old dad. He's using it all over again now, right? The things that I learned in high school now in my professional life, I'm using it. And pairing the two together is awesome. Um, I'd like to talk about one more thing. It did, did, uh, I hope we answered for Alex the retraining of the model. Just to let you know, Alex, um, 
there is an option when you load in a model in RGS Pro to do the additional training to actually point to a DLPK that Omar is talking about. You basically start from that model and now go on from there. That is how you do it. It's a little checkbox to basically unfreeze unfree unfreeze the model and load the pre-existing model to go on from there. Okay. Um, Greg, I don't know if you've had experience with that. Uh, can you do I that? I actually haven't. I haven't. Uh, okay. I haven't used that too much. I'm. I'm more like a, a data janitor in that. You know what All you're right. saying. I have notebooks that are huge that go and join join data to at, join attributes to data, uh, and then I have a notebook that runs like five lines of code and, and runs the model. So I feel like I'm more in that data janitor. Yes. Um, well, well, new term for this uh, session <laughs> here: data janitorial. Right. So. Let's add that as a class, maybe uh, to one of to one of the to the John. I'll talk to Jerry about adding it to the John Hopkins uh, repertoire of uh, classes in here. There's a session. There's a question by Felice. Can GeoAI be used with blockchain analytics? It'll be very interesting. Uh, blockchain, as you know, the blockchain is an immutable database that is distributed. Um, that is the key about it here. And again, immutable action. Can GeoAI be used with that sure if you're using that blockchain as an input to geoai where you know that the data is has not been changed um so it's an interesting it, it's an interesting story again um the question is can we integrate again a little bit deviation here can we do, do integrate blockchain with rgis packages guess what if you find the python module bring it in, you can do it the same thing as like scikit-learn and all these other things in there, which is which is pretty, pretty good in here. Um, so there are somebody and but a concept. Um, can you point to online resources? Again, please, uh, Alex, look at the chat room. There is a lot of uh, references that Omar put in there of demos, uh, tutorials, uh, live examples. So please look at there. There is, you will find some very, very good stuff in there. And, uh, uh, and Mansoor, I'd just like to add uh, from the remember. comment from Ann Johnson, that's the, the geotechcenter.org mm -hmm. is an excellent online um, repository for a lot of information. So she, she's pointing people to oh, that. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're gonna we're we have we're almost here at the top of the um, of our session. Um, any parting words, uh, Dr. Maiden, uh, or anybody else, please? Well, I'm excited and I'm learning, so maybe next year I can I can uh, give you an update. I I look forward. Actually, as I said, uh, you have a standing offer from me to come to campus here <laughs> and uh, uh, and work together. Um, parting words, Greg, uh, Omar, uh, David. Sure. So uh, I'm I'm excited to see more undergraduates starting to get interested and in starting to learn this stuff because over the five years or so that I've been teaching, I feel like uh, I've noticed that them taking on more programming courses and just being more prepared to learn this as an undergraduate. So I'm excited to see this pushed into the undergraduate curriculum. Excellent. Omar, parting words. I mean, same thing. I would definitely encourage everyone to start doing this today. I mean, there is no reason, to be honest. I mean, it's becoming very easy, very accessible. I mean, we have literally more than 50 notebooks, and I've shared all, the, uh, all those links here. So it hasn't been easier. And uh, you guys have access to all the needed software. So yeah, reach out if you have any questions. We would love to help. We would love to see you guys adopting this technology, because honestly, it's fascinating. Right. Uh, when it comes down to Moses here, he asked a question. He's an urban designer and he works with uh, the drone and he's looking for models to help him with the, the subtraction model for the accumulation and all these correction. Uh, I'm not aware of any products. Again, you have to talk to the drone team about that. But could we work, we as the GOEI team, with them to come up with a model that will help with the correction? It'll be a very interesting story to tell. And guess what? It's all about data labeling, right? So if we have the models that can that we taught it how to do corrections, remember, it correlates but it doesn't mean causation, which is very interesting, right? So again, in neural network and deep learning, it correlates based on the data that you give it, but this is where the human stays in the loop. 
you have to do the possession and thank God for that, right? Uh, so a lot of people are working on making that block box uh, translate into quote unquote English, so like that you see what's going on, but uh, we'll, be, we'll be going from there, okay? So with that, I am gonna give it back to Jerry. I wanna thank the panel here. Uh, Dr. Madden, Omar, Greg, and David, uh, though you were in the background, you were instrumental in everything here, watching everybody, appreciate it. Uh, Jerry, back to you.